perception is such a high level cognitive phenomena that gives and that gives rise to virtually everything that we do as human beings and this is not true just of humans too it's also true of animals as well how are these sounds which are mechanical waves that are essentially impinging your eardrums how are they converted into things that you can understand what what i'm saying why do we enjoy music as a sound not in any other sense Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us again on Ask Our About. I'm your host Pranay J. Reddy. Today, let's start with one concept: perception. Perception, ladies and gentlemen, is a tricky thing because whatever we perceive is not actually our reality. For all we know, it's just a version of our reality. Now, what do I mean by that? For example, a person can perceive this pandemic to be a hoax, or a person can perceive this pandemic to be the real deal. What is reality? I don't know but what we perceive to be becomes our reality a bit of a side note here if you think this pandemic isn't the real deal by now well then your perception needs a bit of fine tuning you know like a little course correction because the reality is it is a big all right now we form our perception of reality based on our senses the five senses we are taught in school and then the sixth sense which is the common sense which i find that is not really found in people like me or other anyone for that matter now these five senses i'm not going to sound it up because you all know it anyway but out of the five senses hearing and sight is pretty important for us human beings and one can argue hearing is really really key for all of us because you are literally hearing me right now and you are seeing me right now how can you do that without the senses now all these senses contribute to our perception of reality but our brain can process and pick and choose what it wants to pay attention to crazy right that means you can be seeing a lot many things but your brain is just focused on me right now and you better focus on me right now so you can only see me now this is a little crazy if you think about it because there's this one effect known as the cocktail party effect and no it is not the drunken alcoholic effect all right it's not what happens when you get drunk so the cocktail party effect is our ability to pay attention to one person or other one sound instead of you know all the background noise around us that is a real complex problem solved by our brain now how does that happen well that's why we call it an expert an expert in neuroscience ladies and gentlemen so the expert we have on today is dr ramaratna he is a neuroscientist his research areas include auditory sense and electrosense in weakly electric chain he is known for his research in neural coding and sensory signal processing vocal communication behavior in songbirds and aviaries cognitive neuroscience and human performance he graduated from iit delhi got his doctorate from university of illinois where he was also a senior scientist in engineering and neuroscience he was also a faculty at university of texas san antonio he has around 35 papers 50 abstracts a book chapter and one paper he is an ethics and compliance officer he has been a member of various programs and committee in University of Illinois and University of Texas and he has also been a reviewer for 17 different journals which includes Journal of Neuroscience so that's a bit about our expert today let's move on to the show dr ramaratnam thank you so much for joining us today uh, really do appreciate you taking the time to be on the show with us thank you pranay thank you it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me here well uh, there's a lot of stuff to get into you know uh, you're a neuroscientist and uh, i'd also like personally like to say i i love that field uh, in my in my opinion it's like one of the best fields to be a part of and so a lot of things to understand about our brain a lot left to be uncovered but one of the key things in my opinion which is really tricky is perception you know uh, mm-hmm. so what are your thoughts on perception just in terms of as how people understand perception Yeah I mean this is in some sense if there is a if there is a kind of holy grail in neuroscience perception is sort of one of the problems at the top of the list and the reason is that uh, perception is such a high level cognitive phenomena that gives and that gives rise to virtually everything that we do as human beings and this is not true just of humans too it's also true of animals as well so um it's and the 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 issue with perception is that it's a multi-layered problem which is highly complex 
And while we can access many aspects of perception, and while perception has been studied primarily from a psychological point of view, that is, in other words, from a behavioral point of view, uh, what in, uh, at least on the sensory side, we call it psychophysics, understanding perception of sounds, images, and so on. Um, there is, but perception is larger, larger. I mean, colloquially, the term perception as it is applied in sort of day-to-day -day language is that it is virtually covers the entire gamut of, in some sense, human mental activity, right? All the way ranging from how do we perceive a situation? And you know, that's a sort of a very loose way of using the word perception. In neuroscience, the term perception is a much sort of a stricter definition. It is uh, in, in, so I will use hearing audition, which is primarily my area uh, of research, um, one of my areas of research, but in, in sensory neuroscience, um, where we are asked, to, how do we take sounds, for example, speech, you're listening to me speaking right now. Uh, how is this sound? Uh, how are these sounds, which are mechanical waves that are essentially impinging your eardrums, how are they um, converted into things that you can understand about what I'm saying. So the understanding of speech, there's a reception of speech, there is the under processing and there is the understanding of speech. Ultimately, these mechanical waveforms have somehow to be converted into entities that can be perceived by you and then processed. And so, you know, so our understanding of perception uh, from that point of view, uh, we have a much stricter definition, number one. Number two, but our understanding of perception from a neuroscience perspective, the underlying biological substrate and processing that takes place in the brain is much more limited. So that I think sort of broadly sums in some ways uh, the status of uh, neuro uh, perception in neuroscience itself. Um, that it is behaviorally very well understood, neurophysiologically it is not that well understood. And many of the issues in, in neuroscience and in understanding how brain sort of uh, is responsible for perception are issues that are hot topics sort of uh, in, in neuroscience. So I don't know if that answered your question completely because it's a big question. And <laughs> I, I, I know, I know. I, I just wanted to throw it out there. Like, of course, when I ask first, what your opinion on perception is, we cannot get a pinpoint detail, but I just want to bring it in so that people understand, the viewers understand, and we also get yeah. into a path of where we're going with this. And so from there, I'd like to now fine tune a bit more. You know, so, sure. so as we see, uh, perception is just something, so there's reality and then what we perceive of our reality, which becomes our reality. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So yes. we do that through uh, our sensory, uh, you know, organs, mainly yeah. you know, our senses, our five senses. So would you say hearing is one of the most key, but I want to say key, rather very important sensory, uh, uh, you know, rather just sense for us as human beings. Yeah, hearing is, hearing is a key, key sense, is a major sense, uh, partly because um, many, many issues that have relate, are related to hearing, at least in human beings, they are related to speech. You know, much of our uh, ability uh, for hearing is devoted a lot to speech uh, because it's, it's important for social communication. Uh, but also much of our hear, hearing is also devoted to many other aspects, um, such as uh, processing of sounds that may be important for survival. You know, you're walking down the street, you want to be aware of traffic, traffic noise, you want to be aware of cars coming and going, um, because there's a survival advantage in being able to hear things. Um, then there are other aspects of hearing that are more subtle, maybe more complex, uh, like music perception. It's a, it's a huge, it's a field in itself that I cannot even begin to talk about because it's just too complicated. Why do we enjoy music? It's a simple question, right? Why, what is it about me? What is it that tells us something is discordant and unpleasant to the ear and is definitely not music, but why is music so, so soothing and pleasant to listen to? Uh, not soothing so much. I mean, soothing is one of the things, but why is it that we enjoy music as a sound? Not, not, not in any other sense. So yeah, so I guess, yeah, hearing is important in many ways. Uh, so is vision, and some, some people would argue vision is more important. We are highly visual animals, so. So um, there are two parts to this answer, like you said, like, you know, there's not just one right answer, but like I said, hearing and vision is pretty important for us as human beings to, you know, understand where we are and understand our reality, rather to perceive. So, but then there's also the processing in our brain. So can you talk a little bit about the, pro you know, from, us hearing the sounds, mechanical sound waves in our ear to how it gets processed in the brain. 
Oh yeah, that's uh, uh, that is a big question too. Long, it, it could take a long time to explain. Let me try to put this as simply as possible. So yeah. we have the first we have begin. You first begin with the question: Why do we need two ears? Right? Why we have two eyes because we have binocular vision, and we need to have binocular vision. It gives us depth perception. But why do we have two ears? And so that's kind of an interesting question in and of itself. Uh, we have two ears because there is an advantage to processing sound from both ears. Uh, one of the major uh, one of the major advantages is you can tell the direction from which the sound is coming mm-hmm. using two ears. You cannot do that using one ear. So what happens really is that you have two independent sources of sound, possibly the same sound, impinging on a ear drums, and then initially in the as it goes through the auditory nerve, which is the nerve going from the ear into the into the brain itself, it's a peripheral nerve. The auditory nerve, the sensory nerve, is carries information from each each ear. So each ear is, you know, what what we call monaural or a single channel from one ear. But once it once it starts forming synapses and makes sort of, you know, goes into the brain and starts, you know, communicating with other neurons, very quickly as you go through successive stages of processing, information keeps crossing and crisscrossing between both the left and the right ears. So single neurons, which at the level of the auditory nerve only processed information from one ear or, or received sound from one ear, now these neurons are receiving information from both ears. And the vast overwhelming, overwhelming majority of neurons in the auditory system in the brain are by what are called binaural neurons or neurons that process information from both ears. And so this kind of a crisscrossing, like almost like a ladder goes all the way up from the brain stem up into the into a midbrain structure called the inferior colliculus, which is one of the major obligatory relay stations where a lot of processing takes place, particularly with respect to where a sound is coming from. Um, so that takes place at the level of, of, the, of, the, of the midbrain. But one important thing that I forgot to mention is that fundamentally the ear analyzes pitch, frequency. So essentially, pitch is a key component uh, that is that is extracted from sounds. And so you have multiple parallel pathways of neurons coming through the auditory nerve from each side of the ear that are essentially carrying information related to the pitch of the sound or the frequency of the sound, which is a colloquial, in some sense, a, a colloquial term for frequency. Really, the word really is frequency. Um, so there are multiple channels of information related, related, related to frequency, which ultimately lead to processing of pitch. So that's one thing that's going on in parallel. As these things, as the processing of pitch is going on, there are other things taking place. Um, you know, for example, where is the sound coming from? Uh, that is one key, key, key aspect of it. Uh, when is when are sounds starting and stopping? Onsets, offsets, you know, detecting uh, onsets of sounds. So these are all issues. I'm sorry. Uh, these are all issues um, that are. Uh, um, these are all sort of. These, there are many different features of the sound that are processed as you go along. Um, it turns out that in the case of speech, um, there are two fundamental things that are extracted. There is the, uh, f- there is the um, pitch characteristic of the, of the speech, which gives us many clues about the identity of the speaker. Uh, is it a female? Is it a male? Is it someone we know? Uh, these are all issues related to the fundamental pitch of the sound. And then there is the so-called the speech, ca- the, the aspects related to the speech itself, the meaning of the sounds itself, which is carried in a different aspect of the waveform, which we call the envelope of the waveform or the modulation of the, of the waveform. And so without going, too much into, without going too much into technical sort of jargon here, um, there are multiple, I think the key thing to take home is there are multiple features and sounds that are processed at different levels of, of brain until you go all the way up to the cortex where there are high level aspects related to association of sounds with visual objects, association of sounds with memory and so on and so forth that are then extracted. So that in in a nutshell is sort of roughly and and perhaps not very clearly is what takes place in the auditory system. Uh, Uh, Does that sort of partially answer the question? Let me, I completely forgot to turn off my my phone. Let me me turn off my phone here. Go ahead. Sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. So uh, sticking to that, like, you know, uh, I came across this term and I'm, you've done research on this term and uh, the cocktail party effect. Now, before we go too much into what it is and what the effect does, uh, you know, in terms of processing uh, hearing, I just want to know where the name came from because we as a scientific lot aren't very good with our names. Yet this yeah. name sounds really good. Yeah. So why is yeah. that? 
Yeah, the cocktail party problem is uh, is a has received in some sense a great deal of attention over the years for a long time actually, and it was originally coined by Colin Cherry. Colin Cherry was an auditory uh, uh, I, I, he's an auditory psychophysicist. He mean he worked on auditory processing, and he was in Imperial College in London, uh, but I believe he also was at MIT in in Cambridge. And um, so Colin Cherry wrote this what is today considered a landmark paper in 1953 in the Journal of the Ecological Society of America, where he coined the term cocktail party problem. He was the first person to find that, coin that phrase. And that paper is hugely influential in the auditory uh, psychophysics and behavior community. Uh, it's been cited more than 5,000 times. I mean, remember that most scientific papers uh, don't get cited more than a few times. So 5,000 plus citations to a paper is enormous. It's a huge influence, very influential paper. And Colin Jerry uh, coined the phrase cocktail party problem, and it really, from a layperson's perspective, the cocktail party problem is the capacity of individuals with normal hearing to be able to stand in a room full of people who are all talking at the same time, and to be able to focus their attention on one person while selectively ignoring everybody else, or selectively focus attention on one person while ignoring all, all other speakers, or all other talkers, as we say. Okay, so that capacity is called the cocktail party problem. And the remaining speakers on uh, which you want to suppress or the, the voices that you want to not hear or ignore are called distracting sources or interfering sources. So, we, so really speaking, it is about separating, the cocktail party problem is about separating out a single sound of interest while ignoring uh, all others. And into this cocktail party problem is tied, again, layers and layers of issues, uh, among which, for example, is the issue of attention, which is a hugely interesting topic in, in, in neuroscience. So Colin Cherry started off the whole thing in 1953, and we have stayed with that name ever since. So and I was so fascinated by the name. Uh, sorry. No, I was just fascinated by the name, and I, I, when I was doing my PhD work on it, it just sounded so cool to work on it. So I did. <laughs> Yeah, it does because so uh, I want to just uh, digress for a moment here to ask: Was uh, Colin Cherry actually in a party drinking cocktails when he came up with the hypothesis? Oh, uh, he never mentioned. Uh, he never <laughs> said that. He just he, actually in the in the very second page of his paper, in parentheses, he just calls it cocktail party problem and he puts it in quotation marks. So clearly, if there was an original source to the problem, I mean, if it was someone else who had coined that name, terminal that that phrase. Maybe he would have mentioned it, but he didn't. So I think that the, the, the phrase belongs to him. He said it. Uh, whether he actually was in a cocktail party, I don't know. Uh, but he came out of the, it's interesting to note that he came out of RLE, which I think stands in MIT, which stands for the Radio Laboratory for Electronics, I think. It's, it's, a very famous, it's a very famous laboratory in MIT that does, has done a lot of seminal research on hearing. And it has a lot of engineers including, and, and neuroscientists and psychophysicists. So it has, it has been responsible for some very seminal groundbreaking research. And so he came from RLE and MIT where there was a lot of attention, there was a lot of interest in many of the engineering aspects of the problem. Uh, of separate, so strictly speaking, the cocktail party problem at the root uh, is, it belongs to a class of problem called separation of sources. So you have multiple sources all mixed up, right? Uh, how do you separate them out? How do you pull them apart? So if you take an orchestra and you're recording, if you go to a recording studio, you see that each one, each instrument or each voice has got its own microphone and they're all essentially recorded in multiple tracks. And then these multiple tracks are processed later on for volume balances, that and the other, and then they're all merged together, right? And then once you mix them and you have one single channel or one single track, how do you separate them out? But that's what the brain does in the cocktail party problem is that it's separating out mixed up sources, right? So, so uh, that's what makes it. Yeah, so that's why I want to ask because uh, in, in, you know, like an orchestra recording, everybody has separate, you know, input sources, the microphone. For us, it's just these two years where it's like two constant years. noise coming in from everywhere. Yet, how is the yeah. brain able to distinguish because they're all just mechanical sound bits, right? Yeah. There are, there are, that is very true. And that I think is the key thing that most people often sort of fail to, or it's not that they fail to understand, it's just that we are not even aware of what, of our capabilities, the, what the brain is doing. So we don't realize that everything is coming jumbled up into the ear. It's all getting mixed up. 
and it's the sum total of all these vibrations that are reaching your ears. And remember, it's uh, these are pressure waves, these are longitudinal pressure waves, and they all add up linear. They are all, it's a linear system in the sense that it all adds up. You can simply take each one of these individual waveforms and just sum them up, and then just you know present them to the two ears. But the but the but the auditory system is remarkably good at separating out these sources into their component sound sources. Now there are limits to this. I see that's kind of a loose hand waving sort of way of putting it. But um, strictly speaking, you should be able to pull out, or the brain is able to extract the one sound that it is interested in to the exclusion of all the others. And then there are performance issues here too. You know, it doesn't happen perfectly. And then there, it starts to degrade as the noise levels go up and so on and so forth. But yes, the, 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 the auditory system is capable of doing it. Animals, all, other animals are also capable of doing it. It's not only humans who have this ability. And it's not only mammals which have this ability. Frogs have this ability. You know, we've, it's been shown many times. And so, but the interesting thing that I want you to keep in mind, and perhaps you know, the, reader sh the, the listener should be aware of, is that um, the, the cocktail body problem for human speech is extremely hard to solve from an engineering point of view if you take two microphones. In other words, let me give you, let's say that you put two microphones inside your ear and you record the sound as you're listening to them, okay? And then later on, you simply take these two microphones, uh, you take the sound recorded at these two microphones, and then you ask, can I separate the sounds out? It turns out to be a very, very difficult uh, and challenging engineering problem. And there are, to my knowledge today, there, is not, there are not many approaches that can actually, or there is none that can actually separate out a sound from input given to microphones. Multiple microphones is possible, but two is hard, especially if you have more than two, two people talking at the same time. Um, does sort of does that answer? What is some of the one of the questions that you asked? Or yeah, yeah, it, it does. But uh, again, it goes back to the point of like you know, and you brought this up numerous times. How we are, or rather, our brain chooses to focus on one person or rather one sound over many other. You know, so uh, let's so like you said, in a room full of people, we hear the noise of everything, yet we're able to focus on one. So is that solely based on how our brain is processing it? Or does it like shut off some ears, you know, listening capabilities? Is that, how does that take? So, yeah, there is a, there is a, you cannot, I mean, it, let, let me first describe very quickly what Colin did, Colin Cherry did. He essentially, he did two experiments. So the first experiments, he took two sounds from two people, from one person saying, saying something, twi uh, two different things. Okay. So it's the same person speaking and, but saying two different things. And he mixed them up and he presented them to both ears through a headphone, pair of headphones. And he said, focus on only one of those sounds and report to me what you have, what you are hearing. And it was verbally, the person had to report verbally what was, what was being heard. So remember what the experiment is. Two sounds, two sets of, uh, two speech waveforms, uh, two speech, how do I put this? <laughs> uh, two sets of sentences, let's say, okay. uh, uttered by the same person, uttered by the same person, but mixed up and presented to both the ears at the same time. The second was, and this was fairly challenging, but the person could do it, but it was not very easy. The second and the interesting experiment was, he said, instead of presenting both of them together to both the ears, he presented one to one ear and the other one to the other ear. And he said, focus on, let's say the right ear and tell me what you heard in the right ear. And it turned out that the, person could, well, the, the person's performance was remarkable. The listener's performance was remarkable. You could really, the moment you split the sounds up into two ears, say now you're only attending to one ear and not the other, you could, the person could easily sort of regard, uh, could easily say what was being said. And that gave, that gives a, that gives an interesting clue that if you, if your sounds are coming from two different directions, just using the direction information may be enough to allow you to separate the sound. So that direction information cannot be, that direction information must be present in the source of the sound itself. So part of the answer to your question is that you do need to have two ears. You do need to have two inputs coming from the two ears because they're not the same. Remember that a sound coming to the two ears, if it is coming from one side, let's say from my left side, will reach my left ear first and then after a brief delay, it'll cross over to the right side, right? That's your, what we call the interaural delay. And the interaural delay is extremely important. There's also differences in the intensity of the sound within two years because the head is pretty big and acts as a shadow. So the physical aspects of these, of the sort of the acoustics must be present 
in the sound, and then it goes into the eardrums. The rest of it is computed in the brain. So it's a combination of things. These cues that are necessary for, for separation of sources must be present in the sound. You can't just cue, create the cues out of nothing. Uh, if you erase the cues, as Colin Cherry did in the, first, in the first experiment, he just combined, mixed up the two sounds, the cues were completely gone. There were no inter-oral delays. There was no directional information in the sound. Both sounds appeared to come from the front. And then that, that kind of the ability got, got degraded. So yes, so you need both. You need to have the sound information. The, that's why you need two ears. That's one of the key reasons why you need two ears is you need to preserve the differences between the two ears in order for the brain to be able to extract that information. And it does it remarkably well. Uh, it does it really well. So uh, in, nowadays, in today's uh, research in neuroscience, how much attention is being paid to the processing of attention in our brain? Oh, it has always been. Attention has always been a very hot topic. I mean, there has been no, uh, I don't, cannot think of a single time when attention was not an important problem. Uh, you know, it, um, since the time of Colin Cherry, selective attention, this is, by the way, a problem in selective attention. You're selectively listening to one ear at the expense of the other ear. So selective attention is, um, has huge importance. It has importance in knowing how the brain processes information. That's at a very fundamental, basic biological level. But selective attention is also important to understand from a behavioral and a psychological point of view, because many aspects of attention uh, are relevant in modern life, uh, in our lives, not just modern life, in our lives. Uh, for example, kids learning in school, you know, uh, who have attention disorders. Uh, of course, again, the word attention disorder, is, the word attention is a bit loosely used there, but it roughly means, it roughly means what we mean, what is meant in neuroscience. Um, and so, you know, attention is, is, has enormous uh, impact on, on a range of human activities. And so it's obviously a hot topic. So uh, where, where do I even begin? I don't even know where to begin because I don't even know how big the literature on attention is because it is so big. It's huge. Uh, virtually every aspect of, you know, all sensory experiences, all of these, you know, anything we do requires attention. So, so I'm, not, I'm not really answering your question. I'm just making it more complex than, than you asked. It. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I guess, you know, uh, I, I guess one thing is uh, that you said is in the sense like, you know, attention is so big, you know, sometimes you, it's so, it, it's kind of like, it's so obvious you don't know where to start from. Is that a right way to say that? Yeah, but um, there was selective attention actually of all the topics, selective attention has a good history and it, uh, um, there were seminal experiments in the 50s and 60s, of course, beginning with Colin Cherry and then uh, Hilliard over in uh, UC San Diego. Um, many, many aspects of visual attention. And, uh, you know, for example, you can, you can come up with the same experiments in vision, right? You have a cluttered background, let's say some complex, uh, uh, environment, some complex visual scene. And then there is, an, uh, there is some visual object present in that scene that's moving around. And you want to pull that object out and pay attention to it at the exclusion of everything else, all the other distracting objects. So there are similar sort of problems that are there in vision and in audition and in many other aspects of attention. So, and sometimes the problems can be mixed. It can be a combined visual auditory sort of attention problem. So, you know, so neuroscientists very early on started to break down the problem into more manageable, biteable portions. And selective attention was one of them. And Colin Cherry's experiments beautifully demonstrated uh, the power of selective attention. You know, the moment he split the sound up into the two ears and said, pay attention to the right ear, it immediately became obvious that the performance was so much better. Uh, because somehow mentally we were able to steer our, our sort of attentional mechanisms into that one ear rather than the other ear. In fact, it's interesting to note that when the other year, the, 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 the language switched from English to German, so Colin Cherry switched the language, the other, the person who was listening, the, the, I mean, in the same, the same person was listening to both, I mean, had sound coming to both ears, couldn't tell that the language was German. Uh, he knew that some sound was being, was, was coming into that year, but didn't really pay, wasn't paying attention because his entire attention was focused on the other year where, where, the, where the sound which he was attending to uh, was, was being played. So, you know, so our, our power of attention is that good that when we zone in on something, we can really, really exclude everything else. That's a very hard engineering problem to solve, by the way. It is extremely difficult to solve in engineering. But small the brain does it effortlessly. You know? It's a remarkable thing. So, uh, I'd like to sum this up by asking you one question in the sense like, so our power of attention is so good. We have to distinguish so many different facts, but 
that would mean we are perceiving only what we want to perceive instead of what actually exists is that so, right to look at it um no if 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 i ask you to pay attention to the words of a sentence which are mixed up with another with the words from other sentences and you reproduce it accurately you will be reproducing the words accurately right it's it's reality i mean i don't understand i'm not sure that i understood your question uh, uh -huh. it really depends on so my thing is like you know uh, so let's say we're in an environment and you know the way we see the way we hear what we hear from that environment is what we perceive to be as that reality so if we focus on one sound or rather one sight that means that becomes a sole reality for that moment ah i see what you mean well yes oh. <laughs> yeah. yes in a, in a in a somewhat yeah in a, in a in a certain sense yes it is true but that's but that's what gives us an ability to survive right okay. just think about it this way um you know one of the theories for example of uh, schizophrenia is that is a so called gating theory and it is that to to people suffering from schizophrenia one of the problems uh, i'm not exactly sure what the status of this theory is but it used to be uh, it's it's a fairly well known idea that the mechanism of the brain to essentially block unwanted uh, sensory stimulation is somehow lost in people with schizophrenia everything comes in there's a river of information there's a barrage of information flooding your senses and that causes tremendous amount of that puts a tremendous uh, stress on the brain in terms of the cognitive capabilities cognitive processing capabilities so if you were to if you were to be in that situation where you could pay attention to everything that's happening in your environment visual auditory tactile whatever it is uh, you would be overwhelmed it is not it would it you it would be harmed perhaps more than it would do you any good and so you know it's i think that having selective attention and having a, an ability to focus on certain things and inhibit other things and not process other information is good for our sanity is good for our survival think about it another way is that you are if you're an animal in the wild like a deer for example and there is a lion lurking in the bushes um and the, and there's some faint noise now remember there's a lot of sound coming out there's a lot of you know trees and breeze and wind and other animals and so on and so forth and there's a faint rustling sound in the bushes and this deer immediately zones in on that and attends to that sound because it wants to know if there is something there that is going to threaten its survival well then you need attention you need selective attention now for that moment at that moment that is its reality in that sense of the word that it is it has to process that information in order to survive how much more real can that get right so i i i kind of i kind of see the question you're asking but i think that it's in the in the in the in the scheme of things and as far as attention and processing of information is concerned i think that understanding what is relevant and processing what is relevant at that given moment in that behavioral context i think is is probably more relevant so i think in that sense it is important well uh um... Well, that was beautifully put. So I guess it's uh, something we definitely it's an evolution advantage which you know is definitely needed for us. It uh, yeah, it can maybe you know divert our reality slightly in the sense like you know we might only perceive part of it, but that is because that is what is needed for us at that moment. Yes. So uh, so well then. Um, so I guess that covers everything we wanted to cover about cocktail party effect and perception, and uh, you you explain. to all of us in brief and in short notes on everything else so thank you for doing this is what i'm trying to say and uh, really thank you everyone on the show for doing this thank you pranay thank you no I, it's a, this is an interesting topic and i enjoyed talking about it i hope that uh, in the short time you get some idea of of what what cocktail party processing is about okay thank you very much thank you thank, thank you. you for being on the show thank you now that concludes the interview And if you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, it is crazy. Like everything is happening around us. You can see your room or whatever, wherever you are in. You can hear all the sounds. Yet you can only choose one part of it to focus on. So that would mean you never truly really get a true picture of what actually happens out there because your attention is only on one object or one thing. So for all those know-it-alls out there, you don't know it all because you can't even sense. the whole environment you are in i hope this was informative and i hope this was fun as well because it was really fun for me and i hope you recognize that there's a lot of work to be done in seria and a lot of scope as well for everyone if you like this video do like share and subscribe and if you did not like this video 
well then your perception is just wrong all right it was a really good video you should have liked it so do anyway like share and subscribe thank you so much